I mentioned, I, I had the privilege of going to the, uh, the uh, Paris Agreement uh, Conference of Parties in uh, December of, of 1999. It was going to be held in Chile, but there was some civil unrest. So like four weeks ahead of time, they decided to move it to Madrid. And it was quite a, quite a logistics uh, uh, challenge for them, I'm sure. Um, I, um, I was supposed to go to another group. They decided not to go, and a lot of people didn't go because they just ran, had run out of money. They'd already spent their money on hotels and, and so on. But the uh, International Energy Society happened to know their president and, he, and uh, ran into him. It, it actually was thanks to Martin. And uh, so anyway, I got to go, represented the International um, Energy Society as, as their delegate. So that was, that was really a major privilege to be able to do that. This is the entrance. Uh, this was the first, the first morning, you notice no security. A few days later, when all the powers that, that showed up, full, full uh, cars, arm, armored guys with their AK-47s, et cetera. There was a lot of, a lot of dignitary there. Um, and this is the typical um, signs that were all over. Um, and this is a typical uh, meeting of the delegates. There's the governmental rep representations, 195 different countries. And then there's the um, organizational representatives, which that was one of those. And it's kind of like the typical city council or, or United Nations General Assembly where, yeah, all, all that pontification is going on in the General Assembly, but the real action is outside in the, in the, in the hallways, so to speak. So but it was... Um, very interesting process. There's a few uh, few pictures: China, uh, Marshall Islands, Brazil, and uh, this lady is the um, was the COP president. She was actually the Minister of Interiors for Chile. It was actually the Chile Conference of Parties, but held at Madrid. Okay, and uh, that's not a very good picture of her, but she really did keep the uh, various delegates in line. It was kind of kind of interesting to watch that once in a while, and I did not get a picture of the. Uh, United Nations, or excuse me, United States uh, delegate. Um, I did not represent the United States, by the way. And uh, but I heard a rumor that when the United States uh, guy uh, got up to speak, uh, about 90% of the people in the room, which would be like, oh, at least 500 people, maybe closer to a thousand, got up and left. So that's um, yeah. okay. So outside then was all the activities going on. There was at least 30 of these big pavilions that uh, by. Um, the different uh, countries, China, there's, uh, what is that, Bangladesh, um, Japan, India, et cetera. And of course, the big publicity event uh, was when Greta Thunberg showed up. Uh, that, was, that was huge, uh, just security everywhere. Um, and as she, uh, CNN at that time said, hey, this is number one news story of the year. She was named uh, the Time Person of the Year. And of course, she presented um, uh, you couldn't even hardly get in the door. Um, and uh, Pelosi actually and her entourage showed up. Uh, Bloomberg um, came and showed up and he said, his quote was, I'm here because Trump isn't. Okay, I'm not going to try to be political, but just to give you an idea, it's a very, very political process. And Pelosi and her entourage, actually they came by our booth, about six uh, other representatives and talked to us about 10 or 15 minutes. Unfortunately, I was off on a bathroom break, did not get, to get my picture with her. Okay, and then Jeffrey Sachs, he's a big economist, I think with, uh, he's with Columbia, okay. And yet, um, one little, other little story, there was a kind of a coffee area and, I, and um, the paparazzi were just everywhere, about, uh, I bet there were 40 or 50 of them, just crazy trying to get to her and she was coming in the back door and the security sit at, people asked me to kind of, you know, leave the, leave the president. So I came around the corner and then the, the paparazzi found out that she was back in that area. And here, I came around the corner, here came this guy with his tripod with the points forward, clearing, <laughs> clearing the path. He almost got me, <laughs> but uh, I was a little, little crazy. Um, Another little side event that was going on is a group called the, uh, what they would do is they give a, um, an award every day for kind of the worst of the country that's not really performing. And out of the two weeks, uh, we, the US, USA got three, and I'll talk about that. I don't think we necessarily deserve those. Jap Japan, which is doing great things with solar, et cetera, but they're also building a bunch of uh, coal-fired plants to replace their nuclear plants, so they, and then they're actually, uh, investing and building uh, coal plants uh, outside of Japan. 
Brazil, of course, Brazil is catching a lot of flack. Australia, and I'll talk about Australia. That's a, they're actually doing a pretty good job, but unfortunately they produce a lot of coal. Canada with the um, um, tar sands, Russia, et cetera. Those, um, they did not uh, do well in their daily awards. And the guy was all dressed up in his dinosaur suit and, and so on. But that was a big event every day. Uh, uh, and at the end of each day, they would usually pull some dignitary out you know, at the end of the day to give a presentation, went, went, kind of a formal summary of what went on uh, during the regular general uh, session. And uh, this one happened to be by, uh, be by the uh, Deputy Secretary, Secretary General sorry, of the World uh, Meteorological Associ Organization. And um, um, so that was, that was uh, pretty interesting, and I'll talk about why she's important. Um, basically, this whole organization comes into the United Nations General Assembly. And then underneath that is the United Nations Environmental Program, which all comes under there, and then the world, the WMO. So they come together and they, they drive the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which we'll talk about a lot. I'm sorry? Oh, the World Meteor Meteorological <laughs> Associate Organization, sorry. All right. And then uh, together then they run this, the whole United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change or the UNFCCC. Okay, that's kind of what that organization looks like. So a little bit of a history. Um, back in 1988, uh, the WMO um, got together with the UN Environmental Program and established the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And they're the ones that put out all the documents you've seen, you know, the, uh, the hun dozens and hundreds of documents. Okay, so they got together in 1992 at the famous Rio uh, conference. Um, I have to know a couple of people there actually there. Um, and uh, so that, that, got, that was formed in 94 then. They, uh, act, they put together the treaty, they sent it out to all the countries to get, to get it signed. And the uh, 50th um, ratification was actually by Russia. 196 countries signed that. And then just because a country representative sign it, then they usually have to go back to their government. The, the government, the, or the, in our case, it's the Senate, or it might be the president of the country to actually ratify it. So just because they sign it doesn't mean it's in effect, it actually has to be ratified. Okay, so, um, and then that was then ratified. You have to have at least 50 of the representatives out of the 196 to be, for it to be uh, ratified. But uh, I think everybody on that uh, 196 list not including the United States, uh, has ratified that. In, I'm sorry? The say again? I think they've ratified the U UNFCCC, not the other ambassadors. Yeah, we can, we can track that down. Yeah, they, um, anyway. <laughs> okay, so they got together and said, okay, we're going to have it. We form, uh, form a treaty for us called the Kyoto Protocol. Um, and say so this is what all of our countries, the separate countries are going to do on their own. It's a treaty, it's just like any other treaty, a war treaty, et cetera. And they're, they're the ones that are going, that's, they signed up and said, we are going to do this. Um, and um, so it took another four years approximately for the rule book to be established. Okay, what is everybody going to do? A minus the US um, and February, um, 2005, then the, photo, the Kyoto Protocol was then ratified. So, okay, we, then they got an operational rule book. That was uh, 2005, minus the U.S. Uh, 2013, uh, IP, IPCC, which I mentioned, puts out all these various documents. They said, okay, uh, this was their fifth assessment report, okay. Uh, they said, hey, this is really not going to work. This is really not working. You know, the reality check, carbon dioxide continues to grow, human act, it's caused by human activity, the Earth's surface temperature has gone up 0.85 centigrade, heat waves, heavy rain, Arctic sea ice melting, et cetera, et cetera. The Kyoto Protocol is not working. Okay, so then in 2015, then they got together in Paris and said, okay, we're gonna do this Paris Agreement, and then that's up to the, each um, country to decide, and of course that's the whole negotiation every year People, uh, the countries get together and say, what are we gonna do? Uh, what's our responsibility obligation? Okay, and um, 
in, tw in April 2016, the United States became a signatory to the, to the Paris Agreement. And then in September 2016, uh, the, uh, President Obama signed it. It's, it's not a treaty, it's, it, you know, the executive can sign it. And uh, I just happen, I'm on the board of a group out of Jackson, Wyoming. It's called Jackson Hole Center of Global Affairs. And we just happened to be in, in China at that time presenting at what was called the Low Carbon Development Forum. And uh, sa at the same time, the U.S. and China signed it together, kind of a little ceremony. And uh, so then that, that was the 50th uh, and 51st country to sign it, so it went into effect. Okay, uh, and then a part of that, uh, uh, President Obama con uh, uh, um, committed $3 billion to the Climate Green Fund and uh, goes on and on. But um, then in June 1st, 2017, um, the president said no, announced the intent to withdraw. It takes t three years to withdraw. Okay, so then uh, last summer, uh, 20, excuse me, two years. So 2019, then the final letter was sent in and it's uh, in effect uh, um, six months or one year. But anyway, the final is November 4th, 2020. That date mean anybody, anybody? It's a Wednesday, okay. The day after election, okay. All right, so just to give you a little a background on IPCC, there's uh, the 195 members, they put out all kinds of reports. They actually don't do the research themselves. They rely on all these other organizations to, to pull the information together. And then their peer review process uh, uh, to do that. And then um, the next big report that's actually coming out in pieces now is assessment report for uh, AR6. So they do those about every three to four years. And there's all kinds of special reports uh, uh, that they put out. There's a, Endless list of them, okay. But the big one that, that you all have seen in the news recently is the IPCC special report on global warming, one and a half degrees. And uh, we could spend a couple days going through that, but uh, I've seen a lot of that on, on the news. And it basically says, hey guys, we're, we're kind of in trouble. There's a really nice summary uh, for policymakers. Um, and that's really easy to track down on the internet. If anybody wants to copy all this, I have all the URLs and so on. Okay, there's a few terms that uh, we need to talk about. One is peak. Everybody walks around and talks about when's peak, peak, peak. What are you talking about? Okay, peak CO2 production. Okay, that's, that's, that was the kind of the key term everybody's talking about. For China, they talk about, about another two to three years, and I'll talk about that in more detail. And the other one was enclave, and that's not exactly a, a nice term, but it's, it's countries and cities, et cetera, that Hey, we've got it, too bad about the rest of you. All right, so anyway, I, I won't go there, but it, since we're talking about ethics, this might be part of the <laughs> ethics discussion. All right, but there's two main things. There's mitigation, meaning, hey, we're gonna do things to stop global war uh, stop the CO2 from being produced. Uh, put up solar systems, wind, et cetera. And, uh, and hopefully that's replacing coal-fired plants, but meanwhile the energy demand is going up, and I'll have some graphs on that. So it's not only replacing what's there, but also providing energy for the, for the growing uh, demand of energy, which is going up uh, uh, significantly. Okay, and then a part of that is also sinks. Sinks meaning uh, trees, forestry, some agricultural processes that will pull the, um, carbon out of the air and put it into the ground or into, into wood or whatever. So mo the, the United Nations wants the, con the countries to focus on mi mitigation, stop it, stop it, stop it. Don't try to clean it up later. And that's called adaptation. And there's a whole list of, of things there, which is here actually. So that's, so that's an adaptation. It could be uh, seawalls, it could be uh, early, early warning systems for cyclones, switching to drop, drop drought resistant crops, et cetera. So the, um, the, the um, United Nations really don't want the countries to say, hey, we're, we're gonna do all this adaptation later. You know, no, that doesn't fly, um, gotta do it now. Now one of, the, one of the issues is that there's a lot of what's called net emission technologies. In other words, you've probably seen pictures on the internet, these great big blowers on a hilltop sucking the air out, trying to remove carbon, and you know, it's somewhat questionable. But the uh, group in Europe looked at all these various net 
admission, uh, excuse me, negative admission technologies in the nets and say, hey, these are just not going to work for us. It's too little, too late, technology is not developed. Do not count on this. Do not count on the nets. They were really adamant about that. Now, some of this F4, F4 station, which means new, new forest and then reforestation, land management, et cetera, uh, carbon capture and utilization, um, um, et cetera, um, enhanced weathering. These are typically the, the technologies that fall under nets, but uh, the word is constantly do not, we can't count on that, okay. Uh, so what is, what is the um, Paris Agreement targets? Oh, well, this, this is the group I was talking about, sorry. This uh, European Academy of Science Advisory Council has very limited realistic potential. Um, none of them can deliver the uh, carbon removals on a scale that we're really going to need. Okay, going back to United Nations for a minute, they've developed, uh, it was actually eight goals back uh, about 2000, and then they expanded them into 17. And uh, so all this work uh, for the what's going to work, what's good, what was not going to work falls under one of these uh, 17 um, sustain sustainability goals by the United Nations. Uh, includes water and, and education for women, et cetera. Okay, you've probably seen um, this um, slide uh, graph many times. And uh, I, just, I just don't think this jump here is from wobbling of the earth or <laughs> anything else. Sorry, I just, you know, <laughs> we get kind of concerned about that. So, and then a lot of people ask, well, what, what, is, what is this little bump here? Why did that drop about, you know, it was like 12,000 years ago? So it's actually called the Younger Dryas, uh, that's a flower pollen, and that's how they originally discovered this temperature, temperature drop. And most of, most of the uh, scientists think that it was from a, a big meteor, although they haven't quite finalized on that for sure. But it's interesting, that's when the woolly mammoths pretty much disappeared and, the, the, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, humans um, kind of started moving around the earth a lot. Some people say that humans killed off the woolly mammoth, but I'm not real sure about that. Okay, this is the other one that I think you've seen a lot, this Keeling curve, it's named after the uh, Dr. Ralph Healing, who first started this back in 1958 at the top of Moa, Moana uh, Lao Observatory in Hawaii. I've actually been up there about 20 years ago, had snow. Uh, there's two, two peaks there over 14,000 feet, so they get snow. Um, I didn't have my snowboard with me, so darn, I didn't get the, didn't get the snowboard. So. Um, and this is a graph that you know, usually don't see the, the the separation between the temperature of land versus the temperature of the ocean. And this is really critical. The land, the land temperatures have already gone over uh, one and a half degrees. Uh, I mean, that's supposed to be our goal, but it's, it's the oceans that are, quote, saving us for the time being. But so that's, uh, as far as the ocean, 50% uh, of CO2 remains free in the atmosphere, 25% absorbed by land, plants, and trees, and 25% uh, approximately uh, absorbed by the ocean. And any one of these you can uh, really dig into. Okay, so this is a real ugly. Any guesses where this is? There's at least uh, oh, half a dozen of these around the world. But, uh, South, you know, Africa, India. It's actually, it's actually Mexico City, not that far away. <laughs> That's the greater area of Mexico City. Um, um, you know, you look, you look it up and you say population of some city. Well, that's not very large, but, if, but when they include the greater area, then that's when they get up to 20, 25 million, 30 million. Uh, I think Tokyo greater area is 37 million. That's the, typically the largest. Those numbers vary, depends upon your, your source. Okay, how about this one? Any guesses where that is? Really ugly. Kern River, anybody know where Kern River is? California. Yeah, okay. And uh, yeah, my, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, I won't go there. Okay, tar sands, Canada. Those are, you can, those are uh, the guys up in the space station and, and women, men and women up in the space station can, uh, can see that from space. Uh, Australia, the ugly, but they're also doing a lot of good things. So you've seen these numbers, these are about a, six week old, I think. 
Uh, but you know, just huge devastation there. And then of course, the smoke and so on, traveling around the world, creating its own weather system. I had to put that uh, Fox and, and Franz uh, Glacier picture up there. My son and I actually snowboarded that uh, in 1997. Well, not actually on there. We went there and toured around, but we snowboarded on South, South Island of, of New Zealand. Um, so anyway, I had a little bit of a personal significance there. Okay, uh, so let's go back to Tuco, all right? Those small island developing states. But they have band together, and as far as the, the um, um, United Nations process, the Conference of Party, they're really a powerful group. They, uh, they're extremely, I said, no, no other group, that's the United Nations quote, no other group of, of nations is more vulnerable to the devastating effects of climate change than the small island developing states. Among the islands most susceptible to sea level rise are those in Tonga, Micronesia, and Marshall Islands. Okay, and, it's, uh, and they're all over the world. The Caribbean, Pacific, uh, uh, Indian, Ocean, Indian Ocean, et cetera. All right, so here's, um, there's several different kinds, not to go into too much detail, but if they're sandy islands, you know, they, uh, they're in big trouble. If they're volcanic, they may last a long time. But going back, um, it, with the um, hotel I stayed at is actually almost like a pension type place. Um, a guy happened to be on the bus with me back and forth. They gave, uh, Madrid gave everybody in attendance, 27,000 people, free, bus, free buses and free uh, um, metro passes. So he and I were on this bus quite a bit and, and uh, the last day we just happened to be down in the lobby together and we found out we both ordered a, a taxi at seven o'clock that morning so we decided to, to share and I and he was very dignified, always wore a suit, tie, diplomat type and uh, probably, well not quite as old as I am, probably about 60 or something. And so I asked him, I said, how did it go? And he turned away from me. He, he, and finally turned back and he said, uh, um, if things don't change within 10 years, he said, my country is going to be gone. So he's going back to his country with that message. <clears throat> and I, with my um, Alfred E. Newman, going back to the United States and everything's perfectly happy. Anyway, it's to experience that kind of thing from people is really, uh, really interesting. Okay. Uh, this is another great site. It shows, hey, if we don't um, um, uh, do something, these are, this is a kind of flooding we can expect by 2050, and there's at least 30 or 40 cities on there. Um, this one happens to be uh, Bang Bangkok, okay. But there's New York, Shanghai, et cetera. Um, here, just bring it ha bringing it home for a moment, um, you probably saw this, what happened like 2.9 billion birds are gone from the United States since 1970. It's the Cornell, the Rocky Mountain Bird Conservancy report. And the biggest one affected is the, grass, is the grassland birds. And my daughter-in-law is a research scientist with the Rocky Mountain Bird Conservancy, specializing in grassland birds. So that's been kind of conscious on my part. And on, uh, I gotta do a little plug here, on April 29th at 7 p.m. at the IMAX Theater, at the, um, uh, the Denver Museum of Science and Nature. They're gonna do a presentation on that. I think it's a Wednesday. So there's a couple of brochures if you wanna, wanna get into that. So sorry for the plug there, but I thought you might be interested. Okay, the scientists are following these nine tipping points. The uh, ocean currents, Atlantic and Pacific, uh, Western Arctic ice sheet, parts of Eastern Antarctica, Arctic, uh, Antarctic, Antarctic uh, ice sheets, Greenland, boreal forest, which is all those big forests across the northern uh, hemisphere, uh, et cetera, permafrost. So they're watching these really closely to find out, hey, is something just gonna go really, really wrong? Um, and they're gonna be in big trouble. Okay, this and the other one is, if you're ever traveling internationally or even, even locally here in Denver, you can look up thousands of different monitoring points as far as air quality. And you can see the dark purple there are the ones that are the, ones that are the worst, of course. Um, China, India, the old uh, part of uh, iron current countries, they're still heavily uh, involved with, with coal. And of course down there, in, uh, this happened to be done 
January 2nd, so it shows up purple really bad because of the fires, not necessarily because of coal production. I'm sorry? Uh, no, yeah, good, good point. Where am I at here? <laughs> um, yeah, good, good, uh, very, very observing. Yeah, and or North Korea. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, let's see, I wanted to, I think, did I skip a slide there? Okay, yeah, there we go. Yeah, but yeah, excellent point. What about China? Uh, yeah, they have thousands of, of uh, monitoring stations in China. Yeah, you can see this whole area right here. Um, when we've been to China about every year and a half or so the last several years and you know, we always check on the air quality and sometimes one, one time it was actually better in Shanghai than it was in Denver. Oh, that was interesting. <laughs> uh, we have our own issues but not as bad as what they do. Okay, so that there's something that just some terms you'll see and you've probably seen them on in news, news media, et cetera. They talk about scopes one, two, and three, but at the World Resources Institute and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development got together and said, okay, these are standards to report your various uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Okay. Okay. They, these are typically come out in the annual report for the company. They're not I don't, some companies are actually, or some countries, sorry, sorry, in Europe, are actually making that part of a, a legal requirement, maybe some fines and so on. But generally, it just comes out in the, in the annual report for that company, well, how, what their sustainability are. So companies and, or countries? Co companies, I'm sorry. Yeah, now I'm sorry. We're switching to companies. Okay, we were talking, good point. We're talking about countries. Now we're talking about countries. Because the, country, the companies, excuse me, countries really can't do very much. All they can do is push their, you know, basically, change some policies and laws and so on to push the companies. I'm sorry. So in the United States, what percentage of companies would you say that are maybe on the stock exchange are actually reporting? I think most of them, yeah. Most of them do, do some kind of reporting. Uh, but the real secret is, okay, what, 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 what do they report on? Okay, scope one is just their greenhouse emis uh, emissions, just greenhouse. Scope two is the electrical. And you think, well, why, why are they reporting on the electrical? Well, it's easy to monitor. Most of them have a meter. Plus, um, that's the biggest source of greenhouse gas. So when they set up these criteria, they said, okay, let's go after electric. Now, scope three is everything else. And that's usually about 90, 95% uh, emissions from a country. Uh, the uh, big beer outfit up in Fort Collins, uh, New Belgium, they did this actually before in, in the late, uh, about 15 years ago. And they, they trace all, you know, how much um, carbon is emitted by, by the grains they bring in and, and so on and their processing. And it turned out that what they had under control, scope one, was only about five, seven percent. The other nine, and that's typical, 97 percent is all this, everything else is going on. You really don't have control over. Okay. One other little quick thing is that... Um, I happened to see an article about uh, a coal company. They said, hey, we're, we're the cleanest, there's extraction, you know, coal, coal company. We're the cleanest. Well, they, scope one, they're using these great big electric, you know, machines, and they made sure the electricity came in was from wind. So scope two, they're, they're clear, scope three, but they don't not talk about scope four. Okay, and in Australia, we're talking about coal companies, but basically they squeaked out of having to report their scope three recently. And uh, you know, that was another whole story. But so anyway, uh, well, and then, then going back here for just a second, uh, scope three for the coal company, they ship it by rail. Well, rail is by far the least CO2 intensive transportation you can get. I mean, you base it on number of pounds or whatever it is. You know, it's, it's very, very low. <laughs> so the railroad companies, uh, I haven't actually seen one of their reports. So anyway, there's scope one, two, and three. And, um, but scope three is, is by far the uh, biggest contributor, which most companies seriously don't have a, a lot of control over. So then you have to go to each one of those individual companies. Okay. All right. So um, one of the groups is Climate Change Performance Index, folks. They, they evaluate all the different, uh, they're about, I think they're about 90, uh, about 90 different companies that, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, countries that produce about 90% of the carbon. 
So they rate them on greenhouse gas emissions, which is like 40%, renewable energy 20%, energy use 20%, climate policy about 20%. So Sweden comes out on top. They do, do not give um, one, two, and three rankings. They're kind of holding off on that. Denmark, Morocco, excuse me, the bottom five, Iran, South Korea, Taiwan, Saudi Arabia, and of course, United States. And I'll comment about that on that in a minute. But uh, that gives you, there's actually four quadrants uh, and, and China is actually in the second quadrant. They're, by certain criteria, they're, they're not doing too bad. And, uh, but there we are again, the, the bottom four, uh, the ugly. And you'll notice that where does the, the U.S. fall short on their ranking, and that is the climate policy. However, the defense of the United States, one of the International Energy Society guys said, um, yes, we realize the United States um, the uh, power plan, the clean power plan went away. It, you know, Obama put it in place and then, and then it went away. But he said the cities, states, et cetera, the utilities have really stepped up. And he said now they're far cleaner than what they would have been under the clean power plan. So we are, we're doing uh, a lot of things right, actually. CCPI I'm sorry? What is CCPI again? Oh, that's the... Uh, Which one, sorry? Oh, okay. I'll, I'll go back. Oh, that's yeah. That's that's the group that actually does uh, yeah climate change performance index. Sorry, I was thinking of the IPCC. Okay. Too many acronyms. All right. So then this so this really is kind of sad, but it shows what we would what, what we could have done if we would have started back here in say 2000, and we. We, we wouldn't have to do near as much. It's not a, a, such a big rush because what, what they have done, what the United Nations have done is giving each country a, a carbon budget and say, okay, you have to clean up your carbon by 2030 to meet the 1.1 and a half degree goal. And some countries have already burned it up. Uh, in fact, one guy said the, the fires in Australia pretty much wiped out uh, uh, Australia's budget. Uh, you know, they produced all the carbon they, they're allowed to. Okay, so and then some, some of us eight years, some of us nine years, 11 years before we hit the one, 1. 1.5. But the idea is what can we do uh, really fast? And a, the other big thing about this graph is if you do it ahead, if, you, if we did it several years ago, that's a lot more, a lot less you have to do now because you not only have to replace that coal-fired plant with solar, with solar, for example, but you also have to clean up all those emissions for the last five or 10 years. So it's a double whammy. So the sooner you get better, get going, the better. Okay, uh, and then just to get a quick idea, China, India, US, as far as coal production, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that that's where we're consuming that. Australia doesn't consume that much coal, but they produce a lot and ship it out, same way with Indonesia. Indonesia is only, only uh, producing about 10 megatons in 1990, now they're up to 474. So, and this, for the U.S. Uh, drop in um, coal production, 648, this is 2018, and 2019 is uh, 610, and it keeps dropping down, but it goes in parallel with our coal power production. 25%, uh, 22%, it continues to drop. Okay, so this is an interesting slide. <laughs> in 2000, China was somewhere around 200,000 um, megawatts. Now they're almost a million, 972,000. That was 2018. They probably are well over a million now. Um, so what? So all this stuff you've read about China just producing, you know, building coal plants, building coal plants like crazy. There, there's the graph that shows it. Now I apologize. The second line um, didn't show up on this. In this copy, but the second line here is the United States. Is my mouse not showing up here? Okay. Second line is the United States. The third line is India. The fourth line is other Asia areas. Uh, and the next one is EU. And then the former USSR. There's still somebody brought up no no data for Russia. Well, they're still using that whole um, USSR data, uh, collecting it on that basis. And then Africa, et cetera, is down the line. But that gives you an idea for the, how much coal uh, is actually being, the power that is being produced. Okay, the global uh, coal power, there's where it's going on. 
The purple uh, and pink ones are either under construction or planned. Not good, huh, folks? All right. You see, um, and the, the yellow ones are the, um, well, the, yeah, there's the really light kind of greenish or they're closing, and then the yellow ones are operating, and then uh, orange is new ones. And you can drill down to e each one of those and get the data. And you notice, I keep talking about Australia, you noticed uh, no, no new coal players, fires uh, planned. Um, India is building some, but they're, they're going to be uh, cutting that off real soon. So there you can drill down. And as in China, um, where we're working is actually here at Taiwan. It's, a, one of the, it's the Shaanxi province, which is a, a, the biggest coal producing province. And then next to it is Shaanxi with two A's is the next largest coal producing province. But there's the biggest coal, coal plant in the world, uh, over, over 6,000 uh, megawatts. OK, so. We've talked about developed countries, companies, that type of thing, and now we need to talk about the developed, un, uh, the developing world, because that is where the huge growth is going to take place. Okay, 50% of the world population is in that circle, and they're growing like crazy. The next next one up would be Africa, growing like crazy. They, uh, one one report said that Africa uh, between now and 2050. Uh, 50% of the population growth in the world will be in Africa. Okay, so that, that's where the huge growth in, uh, in demand is going, going to go. There's 10, 10 of those countries. Uh, yeah, the United Nations calls at least developed countries. There's 10 in Asia, 33 in Africa, one in the Caribbean, which I'm pretty sure is Haiti, um, and then five in the Pacific. Every time you bring up one of these charts, Haiti, one, one chart shows, or one graph uh, data said that Haiti has the least amount of ener uh, electrical energy per capita in the world. At, at most of them are it's more like the, around number 10 and worst in the world. Okay, so we I talked a little bit at the very, very beginning about energy versus um, the economy. And that's what we have to do is separate that energy, economy, growth, nexus. Got to separate that. Because developed countries, they want to develop just like us. But that's part of the whole negotiation. Yeah, we'd love to have you develop. Here's all this wonderful stuff. But, oh, you can't, you can't, you can't grow all your energy things because that's coal and then you get penalized for CO2. So when they do all these uh, gra graphs and charts and coal tied with uh, GDP actually stopped about 20, I think it's 2013. So that nexus is starting to, starting to separate. So that's good news. It, mean, it means that the uh, gross develop, uh, excuse me, the GDP is growing based on other energy sources, renewable energy, hopefully. How am I doing here for time? Okay, I'm gonna have to whip through some of these. All right, so that, that's the whole thing, separating economic growth, which is you know, tied to energy. Economic and energy, you can't have, can't have one versus the other without the other, and to separate that from the fossil fuels. Okay, there, there is, I've mentioned India, they're doing great thing. They built coal f plants like crazy up till now, and now they're going to be leading the world in, in solar, solar development. Uh, these are typically the four areas. Uh, I've been talking primarily about power, and I'll be talking about power. Uh, but also industry, transportation, and buildings. I'll talk a little bit about transportation. But those are the, the four major CO2 emitters, and that's when, when um, they put together their plans, these are the areas that they usually address for each country. Okay, so what's the projections? It'll be about a, about a uh, uh, one and a half thousand uh, billion kilowatts, which is a gigawatt, uh, of energy growth between now and 2050, um, about 1,500. It's about a 38% uh, growth. Okay, this is the uh, Environmental Energy Agency projections. They're not always right. They ignored solar for a long time, and finally they're kind of catching up on their projections. But it, for renewable energy going from 19 to 38 percent, that's really good. I mean, that's as a percentage, but also the volume is increasing itself, not just the percentage, but the actual number is increasing. Okay, so kind of keep that thought in mind. And then, um, but Largely because the, the global solar panel prices have dropped, what is that, $27 a watt in 1980 down to like 30 cents a watt, and actually they're lower than that now. 
So that, that's the driving force. In fact, uh, if you put a solar system on, the, the panels are only about 20, 25% of the cost, the rest of it's labor and overhead and, and the normal business kind of expenses. So there's the capacity in the world, China leading the world like crazy, and they have been for some time. U.S. number two, hey, we're doing well. And then the rest of J Japan, Germany, again, Japan got nailed at the conference, but hey, they're actually uh, doing really well with their solar installations. I think they're, uh, uh, as far as capacity, a third in the world. Germany, of course, India is gonna be, in three or four years, and I think India is gonna be out there ahead of everybody else, UK, et cetera. Gives you an idea. Okay, um, and then you talk about, well, that's capacity. How about additions? Well, last, uh, in 2018, China uh, in increased there, what is it, 40, 45? That's almost about a 25% increase in their gigawatts in solar capacity. U.S., um, we did our share of increase and so on uh, throughout the rest of the world. Okay, but then you say, okay, yeah, that China is huge. They're four times bigger than ours. Yeah, they're building all this, but then we're, you know, at a population basis, hey, we're, we're doing actually better than China. So here's a nice little graph. Um, and again, Australia, doing great, all right? <laughs> so you gotta watch how the data sliced and diced. <laughs> China's doing pretty well, uh, 10 to somewhere, these are really large ranges of numbers, 10 to 100 watts per, per capita, et cetera. Um, and uh, this data is a little bit old uh, at the 505 gigawatts in, uh, gigawatts, sorry, in 2018. Uh, they're projecting it'll be um, at least eight or 900 um, this year and uh, increasing about 15, excuse me, 15 or 20 percent a year. I think you're all familiar with, uh, uh, instead of giving you a million dollars, or you give me a million dollars, how about you give me a penny today, two pennies tomorrow, four pennies, and then all of a sudden I got a lot of money. So it's cre increasing uh, really, very rapidly. And uh, I'll talk about the economics in a minute. But here's solar production per capita, okay, versus, um, um, that's a detail of the previous, previous slide. So again, China, by far the biggest inst installation is installer and manufacturer of solar, but per capita, no, Germany is out there leading the pack. Okay, and then the real acid test is solar penetration per, uh, as a percent of electrical production. Global average about two and a half percent. Honduras, Remember, I, I said I'd talk about Honduras. Amazing, <laughs> they're out there. Well, it's still like 14%, but they're, le they're leading the world. And so Germany, of course, uh, and a lot of the European countries, U.S., again, as a percentage of total electrical production, we're not doing all that, all that wonderful. Just a note about Honduras. They're sure. also murdering their environmental activists as fast as they can. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah it's, not, it's not a pretty <coughs> picture. Um, I, Dr. Bob, he does a lot of work in uh, an island off of Honduras, and yeah, but, it's, but it's, again, it's just, it's back and forth, pros and cons, okay. Um, so this is a, sim a similar chart, uh, as far as, mainly I just put this in because I wanted to see, the, you see the curve of growth, and the question is, how fast can that keep going up? Um, well, hopefully it'll, it'll keep, uh, keep going the way it should. And a lot of analysis say, hey, you know, we're, we're going to, well, here, here it is. They, uh, th these are these huge solar th panels or, or parks. Uh, some of them are like five miles by 10 miles, um, 6.3 million panels, and the biggest one that's uh, in India. And uh, the Interna excuse me, International Energy Agency has really caught up with solar as, as a potential, and they talk about solar may provide up to 70% of new power Okay, I've got 12 minutes, so I gotta really hurry here. Uh, of new power between now and uh, 2050. 70% would be, and about 10% wind. So, okay, we'll talk about electric cars for a little bit. Uh, this is an estimate on electric for transportation. By 2040, they're talking about, um, you know, a very uh, a significant Im impact of solar cars. Again, China is leading the world, and uh, that's the blue chart, or excuse me, the black as, as part of the blue. Uh, and then here's a little little quiz. <laughs> they look at okay, how much how much of these different things, um, whether it's power, et cetera, uh, shipping, um, um, contributes. Well, as far as measuring the in the increase itself, is SUVs are second only to power, to the power uh, industry. 
That is, that is really hard to wrap your head around. Well, wait a minute, SUVs are getting far better mileage than they did 10 years ago, but there's 10 times more of them and they still uh, use a lot more gasoline than a regular you know, a family sedan. So that was, that was kind of an eye opener. Again, that's from the International Energy Agency. I took a picture of their slide. <laughs> okay, wind, the same type of thing, an upward uh, scale. And then, of course, this gives you a little break on uh, the, the cost. Of course, the yellow line is solar going way down, um, nuclear is going up, um, um, wind and, and uh, so on going down. Um, this is, you so, go back to the graph again, please. Okay, sorry. The US dollars per megawatt five. This, um, the one with the lines on it. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, I'm going to go. You were there, right there. There we go. Tell us what that means. Um, yeah, US, US dollars per megawatt hour. Okay, you have a kilowatt hour you know, on your house, so this is megawatt hour. So it looks like yeah. solar has come down to the lowest in 2018, and whatever is the gray one, uh, nuclear is the highest. Yeah, it's the cost of nuclear according to this data. And coal is the next highest. Yeah. Wind is very low. Wind, wind yeah, is yeah wind, wind is way down there. Yeah. So that. You know, I've given you a lot of bad information, but here's, here's an attempt to say, hey, we've got it. We're going in the right direction. It's like wind and solar have intersected there. Yeah. And there, yeah, we could probably spend an hour talking about wind and solar and the load. <laughs> okay. All right. But yeah, good question. Thank you. Uh, all right. The, as far, okay, you have a good technology, you got a market, everything's going well, but you got to have the money. Okay. So what's happening? Uh, over the last, since the Paris Agreement was signed, 33 global banks led by JP Morgan has invested almost $2 trillion in fossil fuels since the, since the climate um, accord. Uh, and it's led by the top four, et cetera. The, uh, however, things are definitely changing. You probably saw in the news here about a month ago, BlackRock is taking their tri uh, seven trillion and supposedly divesting from, from um, fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. J.P. Morgan just got, came out a report of, about a week or so ago talking about uh, the, the most extreme risk of climate change can't be ruled out, including the collapse of human civilization. We cannot rule out cat catastrophic outcomes where human life, as we know it, is threatened. So even J.P. Morgan is shifting their thoughts in a positive direction. Now, again, going back to the uh, developing countries, the uh, International Solar Alliance is part of the... Um, came out of the uh, COP22, and they're gonna raise a trillion dollars for solar in the, in the tropics, between the Tropic Cap Capricorn and Tropic Cancer. And here's the big uh, renewable energy companies in, in the world, they're doing well in their stock. So financially, we're doing, doing pretty good. Here's a um, series, Denmark, 100% renewable energy target, wind and generate, wind and solar, Danish pension funds, Spain, Spain has, put in a huge amount of solar in 2019. Uh, Denmark is so far north, yet people talk yeah. about you can't do solar in the northern hemisphere. Yeah, it's, uh, it's way north. I don't, it's, what, what is the, um, the Spain? Oh, it's, it's no, yeah, no, Denmark. Oh, Denmark, oh, definitely, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, absolutely. Uh, there's a group called uh, uh, RE100. It's a 221 com uh, companies that have signed on to commit to 100% renewable power. Um, in a certain time frame. There's a ton of information on it. Sierra Club has their Ready for 100 cities. Um, 150 cities have signed on to that. And then there's this world largest floating a wind, a wind turbine off Portuguese coast. It is huge. Uh, I can't remember the, the, the numbers on that. And Costa Rica, mm -hmm. hey, if you sign up a CPR right now, they, if you sign <laughs> up, you, you don't have to donate. I signed up. <laughs> you can go to, you don't have to donate. Just sign up. They might send you to post, Costa Rica. <laughs> Norway's is a mixed bag. They're doing, uh, all right, I, I'm going to skip through these real quick. But Norway's doing a great uh, in, in country, but they're increasing their oil drilling and exports like crazy. So that's that scope three. Um, not, not good, folks. Okay. So key takeaway messages, the good, renewable energy, making real progress. The bad, um, there's this urgency. Uh, we've got to get going absolutely as soon as possible. And the whole thing about solar, it is, I hate to use the quote, shovel ready now. There's so many other technologies, and they're all great. I'm not going to say one, one, that, that they're not very useful, but solar is ready, and wind, solar ready now. Okay. 
So China, there's, if you, you can track this down, the Natural Resources District, uh, excuse me, Natural Resources Defense Council, um, one of their executives wrote a, a, a smaller book, talking, hey, China might save us. So they're, they're the big boys, they're the biggest player on the block, they're moving in the right direction between their leadership and their contribution. Um, only 10 or maybe eight years left, all these various things, financing, Stop fossil fuel subsidies, that's the big one. And of course, sorry to be political, but get out there and vote. Houses on fire, this is so important, like I was just talking about. We can't wait for the new technology. You, if your house is on fire, you can't wait for this new fire suppression system that's gonna come out next year, or, or 10 years from now. You gotta do it now. All right, thank you very much, we appreciate it. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead. <laughs> Just a, a comment and a question. I think having the big four banks in charge of funding is like having the fox in charge of the hen house. I mean, those yeah. four banks are terrible yeah. uh, around what they do around the world and how they lend their money and their predatory lenders, etc. So J.P. Morgan Chase is not good news for the fossil, the uh, renewable and renewable energy industry and, and I, finance. And I, I thought I saw a number I couldn't. Couldn't track it down, but I thought they they fund they fund like 68 percent of fossil fuel development yeah, in the world. That's scary. I think it was 68. Right? I couldn't find it for the presentation. The question I have is: we, we have to be. I think it's really important to be wise about unintended consequences. Like when we cover the desert with solar arrays, what is not getting heated up in the desert ecology? Mm -hmm. Little things like that, like yeah. when, when I was a kid in the 50s, our buddy the atom was going to solve all of our problems. Yeah. We are going to have yeah. almost free electricity with yeah. nuclear power. Well, and so and it's be building as, material, the uh, best thing in the... In the so I wonder if you could uh, comment on, we have to be wise. Uh, the bottom line is we're just trying to produce electricity as, as uh, sustainably as possible, so we have to stay wise and recognize when there are going to be unintended consequences for what we think is a clean solution. Yeah, the, uh, uh, my own solar system, and, and, and basing this on, on that numbers, it, uh, it'll take about three or four years before I save the amount of carbon that, that it took to manufacture the solar systems, et cetera, et cetera. And so, there, uh, and then the recycling of a lot of these products. The, mm -hmm. the wind blades right now, that's going to be a huge problem. These old wind blades that are 30 years old, what are we going to do with them? They're not recyclable. And the strategic and I, and minerals, I, I and the strategic that, minerals that go in. And we have yeah, to min all the to, to third world rare earth minerals, uh, pollution from the earth minerals mining, etc. Yeah, there, there's no silver bullet. Right. It's kind of like what we have to work with. So it's all about <coughs> yeah. just how do we produce electricity? Yeah. That's, that's what it's about. Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah, thanks for the question. I'm sorry, I'm going to kind of go around the room this way. Go ahead. Um, thank you for being here today. It's been great. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, say again. Thank you for being here today. Oh, yeah, no, it's fun. This is uh, just wonderful. This is Isla. Uh, the Isla School. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for being here today. Um, you know, we've been talking about um, uh, environmental concerns since, uh, you know, a long time. And we've been doing a lot of planning and a lot of thinking. So in a way, I mean, is it, are we kind of in a position where if we just decide to turn the switch, we know what? kind of a good checklist yeah. and a good punch list. We don't really yeah. have to. And that, and that yeah, it. that's an excellent question. And I, when I talked about, okay, we have the technology and there's a market and it's cost effective and all that. We have the financing, but I forgot policy, and that's what you're talking about. It's it's all about policy. But I mean, the engineering yeah. and the economics, I mean. Yeah. No, I, I'm that's totally kind of agree. a big thing. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I, I wanted to thank you for the talk. Um, one of, I, I read something a couple of years ago that said that uh, China wasn't even going to hit peak fossil fuel usage until 2040. And um, there's, there's a, yeah, several numbers floating around. And again, like I showed you the graphs, it depends on how the, what data are you uh, referring to, but they, what the, the three years from now is talking about the offset from uh, renewable energy. But, but what you're saying is absolutely correct. They're putting a huge pipeline from, uh, from uh, Russia down into uh, uh, Beijing and, and so on down there. And uh, it's just some monstrous number. But they said that will only provide about half of, of 
China's increased need for energy, what's for in the pipe? fossil yeah. fuel. Well, well, what's I, in my, that pipe? My yeah, point, natural gas, I'm natural sorry, gas. natural gas. My point was, and then on top of that, we only have like eight, eight at, at a maximum of like eight yeah. years to avoid these tipping points. Yeah. They, uh, and one and of even the, if we go to wartime, a wartime style mobilization, which yeah. requires political will, which right. is completely absent in the world yeah. right now, <laughs> it's, it's impossible. Yeah. yeah. It, it's so it looks I, like I agree every time I, I look at these numbers sometimes I get society. really depressed I'm sorry yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry I'm saying my point is that we, we have to because it's impossible it's like you can't get here there yeah. from here we have to we have to resort to catagenesis we have to decomplexify our society yeah. so that we're using less energy yeah. all of us yeah. yeah just I think that one graph it was showing that if we continue, even if we, if, even if the world does not increase energy demand, which is going to, just kind of, add, it's called the business as usual. We're not going to make it. We've got to severely reduce what's there now, and then also accom accommodate uh, the increases. Yeah, if you, you know, people run the numbers, and it's just like, I, I, I try to be positive about it. <laughs> yeah, just, my, my, my brother's here, and I, I still. You talk about World War II and a, um, a uh, what happened during World War II, where everything shut down. I remember my mom talking about, oh, finally after the war was over, she's going to buy a new washing machine. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine the people in America not being able to buy what their products and goods for five, four, or five years? Yeah. So, so another wag said, well, what we really need to do is shut down all automobile production worldwide for about five or ten years. And including EV, because it uses so much water, so much energy, so much car carbon and resources. Uh, and that's what happened in World War II. Everything was just shut down. Right? Bombers. Yeah. We have to have electrical rationing. Yeah, and rationing of everything. Yeah. Now, and I really appreciate your question. I don't have an answer. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I have a similar question, which was, what projections have been done to see how much of, I'm, our, I'm sorry, of the world's to... electrical demand could actually... Don't ask my wife if I'm hard of hearing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've just been wondering, how, have there been projections on how much of the worldwide electrical demand could be changed to, you know, non-electrical if we change our pattern, our behavior patterns? Yeah, the group... Can you um, repeat your question, please? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, how much of the uh, increase of the worldwide uh, electrical demand could be changed to non-electrical? Okay, so, that, but the group I, we actually shared a booth with uh, is the solar cookers. Mm -hmm. You think, oh, solar cookers, those, those funny little yeah. tin foil things, yeah. but they are a huge organization. There's something, I can't remember the numbers, but it's, in, it's the uh, millions of women that die every year from the gases put mm -hmm. off from wood, wood, et cetera. And, uh, but I personally don't know of a technology that really come in and provide what uh, the rest of the world wants, like we have. Uh, yeah, I don't have an answer for you, but. I just wonder if there's yeah. something out there that. Yeah, the only, the only thing that really comes to mind is the solar cookers. And it's amazing what a big organization, what they, what they do. And they had uh, 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 several of those pavilions I, sh I showed are, um, uh, Oil producing countries, and they were in there uh, presenting there, and they were welcome. You know, they were, you know, uh, they had, I couldn't believe how many presentations and press conferences and so on they had in that two weeks. They were really busy. <laughs> but great question. I wish I had an answer. I'm sorry. So, um, I'm Rocky Pier. I uh, direct the Center for Sustainable Urbanism here, and just, just want to do a, a quick little uh, lead in comment and then pose a question to you. So a week ago I was at a forum put on by uh, Environment Colorado and the schools down on the Auraria campus. Okay. What can Denver do about the Paris Accord? Mm -hmm. And uh, we had folks there from both the city and the state uh, very proud of the work we're doing to try to get XL to get to be carbon neutral at mm -hmm. a point in the future. Uh, I had to offer a word of ad admonition and, and that's what I want you to respond to. Uh, I mean, I look out uh, outside day after day here in Denver and see the brown cloud back. Mm -hmm. And I mean, with, with putting uh, everything on XL and also the state goals 
uh, that talked about greenhouse gas emissions after the year 2050. Mm -hmm. Denver now has goals that go out to the year 2050. Mm -hmm. But then I, in my view, the emperor has no clothes. I mean, they're, they're uh, basically advisory, incentive base, and, um, you know, I, we need to do more. We need yeah. to do more than just uh, sure. look at it. I agree. So, I'm sorry. But did, did I miss a question? Or, or Well, my question I, is what, no, what I beyond. Yeah, I appreciate yeah, your yeah. comments. I want yeah, to make yeah, sure. No, I, I, and I'm it. sorry. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. didn't post the question. Yeah. Right. I mean, so we've spent a lot of time today talking about energy and, and power and so on. Mm -hmm. I mean, what else uh, needs to happen? Um, uh, I mean, okay, I would now, say, so. I mean, I was uh, a little surprised at your land management information that that may not and be that, again, anywhere. But mostly that's my bias. I'm, that's uh -huh. not my area of expertise. There, yes. there was a lot of panels and discussion about land management uh -huh. that... Uh, and there's nothing, and it, again, it goes back to the idea that that's amazing, great technology. We, we grew up on a Nebraska farm where we were out there with the tractor disking a couple times. You know, we were out there with the tractor covering the field four or five to six times a year. Now they plant it and they harvest it. That's it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a huge amount of that land management and, and the carbon stays in the soil, et cetera. So, uh, but, yeah. but that's... But that has its not downside. Those are big commercial farms with huge right. equipment. And it's all run by satellites. <laughs> well, that's so, the, and thank but, you. But for I'm going to say the, the actually best thing is don't even use the energy in the first place. Yeah. You know, work at home. You know, whatever. Yeah. Turn the lights off. So I mean, in, in my uh, view, I think we're still embracing status quo, mm -hmm. laissez-faire. You know, develop land uh, yeah. haphazardly and. Uh, with leapfrog growth, and then uh, continue to rely solely on automobile travel. Yeah. I mean, to me, those are those are big culprits that Colorado hasn't come to terms with. So. Yeah. Let's take okay, I got a, one, one or two more, and good then we need to way. hear from yeah. Bill before our time is up. Benita, no, 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 she. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. yeah, maybe um, this is directed at you, Rocky, actually, mm -hmm. because I guess I've taken some solace in feeling like, yeah, there's not a political will on a national level, but that cities and states are making a difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what I hear you saying is, is it's 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 not it's not real. I think city and states are no, making a difference. I think in Colorado, we're not there yet. We're doing. Yeah, it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to say I, the, number, I, the number I did not throw up there, sorry, I'll, yeah, uh, is that, you know, the United States, we have by far the highest uh, carbon emissions per capita in the world. I mean, yeah. I mean China's big, bigger than ours as far as total carbon emission, but they have four times as many people. <coughs> we're still lower leaders. So, you know, we, we got, how, how are we going to, I think the question you're posing, I'm sorry to, uh, uh, is what, how, what, what does it take and what are we going to do to clean up our act? Well, and, and you uh, were saying poor policy, so yeah. I guess I, at, at, at a national level, it's just it's abysmal. Yeah. So it feels like at a local level is pretty much where you want to yeah. spend and your it, time. And, mm -hmm. and yep. Like the one comment about the least carbon for the <coughs> power of the electric utilities. We're really doing a good job there, but buildings and transportation and, and, uh, and other industrial processes uh, mm -hmm. got a long ways to go. And I, and I guess I would say I think we have some really good leadership um, in our state house, but it's not coming from the governor's office. I'm mm -hmm. disappointed to say. So. Yeah. Frustrating. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Who have we not heard from that, that, that still would, would like to join the conversation? Alec and anyone else? Before Phil comes up to have the last word. Okay. Alec, please. So I uh, just received two books on thorium, T H O R I U M. My understanding is that it's a, uh, a nuclear possibility without really very much environmental uh, effects. Mm -hmm. That is to say, the waste is. Uh, a only for uh, about 300 years, including, by the way, of using part of that waste to clean up the accumulation of nuclear waste that we already mm -hmm. have. This is very yeah. new to me. I've never yeah. heard it before, so I yeah. got myself two books about that to find out whether that's uh, very reasonable. 
And uh, the other thing for me is that we won't get these policies that this gentleman and ladies are talking about unless we radically reduce the uh, power of corporations to make decisions in a barely democratic country. Amen. Yeah. 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 I think that, you know Europe has can, a yeah, Europe has a lot more control, power, regulations. And even so, yeah. but that yeah. issue, uh, I think, is really terribly important. Yeah, yeah. I go back to another comment. for a, a <laughs> forum. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Right now, with what's going on in the legislature, I think you mentioned it's a prime time to go down there. We were down. I was down there last week with a group. And uh, talked about with the senator. He said, "Oh, yeah, hey, good idea." And he put a bill in. It looks like it's going to go, go through. It's around buildings, kind of a minor uh, part of buildings, but building <coughs> is the next big challenge. Mm -hmm. They're building. Mm -hmm. What did we come up with? Around 30, 30 some thousand homes in Colorado this year built to really poor in comparison to what they could do, buildings, mm -hmm. uh, energy uh, standards. Following up on Alex's comments, yeah. the, the power grid distributors would love to have a monopoly on the sun. Mm -hmm. They would, and they're mm -hmm. trying, doing their best to achieve it. Yeah. They charge you for if you put too much power on your roof. Yeah. Yes. 